we want to talk about today is epistemic cultures. Now, it's an interesting terminology. Some people would say a slightly contentious terminology. But I think if we're going to be able to get below the surface of the question of the collaborations that occur within a research infrastructure, we need some way, we need some terminology, we need some framework for thinking about how people collaborate and how people come together and why there are perhaps conflicts in this collaboration. And for me, the idea of research cultures is a really important one and a useful one. So this is in some ways the most advanced of the lectures we have here so far because we'll be looking at quite uh, subtle ways of viewing the way we work together. So there's quite a long tradition of viewing research as occurring within cultures, not just national cultures, but research cultures and research subcultures. Um, and I suppose the beginning of much of this would go back to the famous Reed lecture uh, of C.P. Snow in 1959, where he came up with this idea of there being two cultures in science. One of being the, the, the scientist, the perhaps physical scientist or um, biological scientist, and the other being what he calls the literary intellectual. I think it's interesting when you look back at what Snow actually said um, that the, the poll opposing the scientists is the literary intellectual. It's not really what we would call humanities research today. Um, but still this whole idea of there being two cultures within the, the scientific system stays very much with us. So when we're trying to bring them together we have already this idea to overcome, in spite of the fact that much of what C.P. Snow was looking at is probably somewhat debunked. I don't think you can say any more that one set of researchers or another is more ethical or more optimistic. But there's also balancing that, uh, the idea that you would have perhaps from the, the European Commission. Because the European Commission would say, when they refer to the word science, they're referring to maybe the German concept of Wissenschaft. So this is sort of the, the, the crafting of knowledge. Um, and when they say science, they really mean anyone who's doing advanced research. And I, I, I do like that. I find some people will find that a little off-putting when I say to a, a literary scholar, well, let's talk about the science now. Let's talk about your science. They may find that not the most comfortable terminology, but it does align the various approaches to research with each other. Um, a few other perspectives that I find useful in trying to understand the cultures that come together in humanities research infrastructure are, for example, uh, Boyer's scholarship rediscovered. Because for him, you have to not look just at scholarship that is uh, discovery, that sort of pinnacle of scholarship. You need to also look at how scholarship applies within teaching, um, how it applies in integration when you bring it together, and also in application. So having that whole range of scholarship and understanding how it all contributes also helps us to understand what comes together in a research infrastructure. But when we talk about research in the humanities, and in particular in the digital humanities, we very often go back to the, the seminal work by John Unsworth about scholarly primitives. This is a very, um, a very widespread model for talking about how we do research um, and the process of scholarship and the kinds of activities that are involved there, discovering, annotating, comparing, referring, sampling, illustrating, and representing are the primitives that he identified. And they are all very much a part of the research process. What I find difficult, what I find missing in this model is that point when the humanities scholar creates information. These are very, very useful for mapping how the scholar interacts with the world. But actually, when that moment of insight comes, I find it slightly obscured here. And this is why I sort of prefer a different approach to all of this. So if we're going to look at, at knowledge creation, we want to look at knowledge creation as a community process. And I think it's very hard to say that this is not the case because we do have a durable reliance on peer review to validate research. We do have these difficulties with interdisciplinary work. We do have a general agreement among experts as to what is or is not a contribution to, to new knowledge. And we do have epistemic processes which are perhaps discipline specific, but in no way 
subjective in, in that entirely um, uh, capricious and, and ungrounded way that that word is sometimes used. And they're certainly not ad hoc. They're very strong community norms underlying any epistemic process. So knowledge creation differs perhaps from the sciences, um, and we need to recognize that, but it is not a different thing. Now, let's think about that idea of knowledge creation differing, because I find it really interesting that um, what we're seeing now is even in an, in an age when we have a lot of critique of the value of studying the humanities, of researching in the humanities, at the same time we'll see a lot of, of celebration of that very same value coming from strange places. So here we have a wonderful headline from my point of view from the Harvard Business Review, Want Innovative Thinking? Hire from the Humanities. And it's very interesting how the educational system, where it focuses on teaching science and business students to control, predict, and verify, um, again, many voices are coming out and saying, well, actually, the humanities research process, the cognitive toolkit, the set of, of procedures, the set of strategies in dealing with information, in dealing with problems, that this, this, this way of training, this way of seeing the world prepares someone to have, is actually quite powerful in its own way, and in a different way. And that's what we need to respect when we look at how we're going to build an infrastructure to support this, but how we're going to build that infrastructure in collaboration with a scientific or a technological research culture. And that brings me to what for me is very much the seminal work, um, the work that I find is the most firm boundary for talking about these issues, which is Karen Norsatina's Epistemic Cultures. Um, 1999, so it's a little bit, um, it's, 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 it's a few years old now, but what's interesting is we don't have the equivalent yet for the humanities. And the subtitle of the work is How Sciences Make Knowledge. How could there be any more interesting question than that? All right, I'm an epistemic process geek. But what I find fascinating about this work and what I find really useful about this work is the way that um, Norsatina lays out exactly what happens in this process in physics and microbiology. And she talks about the nature of the metaphors. She talks about the nature of identities in these cultures. And she talks about how laboratories function. She talks about different roles, people who are perhaps more um, junior within the lab and whose work so focuses on certain kinds of objects or certain kinds of processes, but also the more senior people whose role is to bring things together. These are different roles that she describes very powerfully and how all of this together creates a laboratory capital. And if there's anything you will be doing in the building and the managing of a research infrastructure, it is trying to build and potentiate that kind of shared capital. So this model is very useful to us. And so useful was this model, and, and so inspirational to me personally, that we took on a bit of research in my team, um, which we call the Sparkle Project, where we went back to that set of scholarly primitives, and we tried to revisit it in the light of an epistemic culture approach. And we were looking at how we could deepen interdisciplinary collaboration, because we figured we couldn't deepen that collaboration, and we certainly couldn't build tools as a technological community for humanities researchers until we really understood what underpinned the, 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 the preconditions for what we would call knowledge on either side. So this was a small scale study based on a series of interviews with historians. And it was, however, informed by the perspectives of a humanist, a computer science, and a professor of design. So we really made sure that we had a, a powerful set of perspectives there to be able to draw from. The findings were interesting, and they told us some things we expected. Um, they told us some things very strongly that we thought we might hear, and there are a few unexpected things as well. So, if you're a humanist, you may find this very familiar. And I think if you're a researcher, you'll find a certain amount of this very familiar. Um, the physical mobility, the idea that there's a sort of a hunter-gatherer aspect to the way a historian works. Um, 
the fact that there's always a, a fight against time limitations because the archive may have certain hours uh, or because um, the office may be open or closed or you may want to work in certain places. Um, this is what uh, a very interesting article called um, uh, How Scholars Read refers to as the clock time of scholarship. Um, a lot of people talked about seeing. And it really, it wasn't the seeing of the thing that they were looking at, but it's about peripheral vision and about serendipity, about how seeing things on the edges, holding on to them somehow, was the eventual driver of a later research question or indeed a research answer. The other things we felt that we sort of overturned that were, were, were well established in the anecdotal uh, view of the humanist was, um, Humanists do create knowledge outside of the writing process, but not all of them. The place of the writing process is quite different for each individual. And this, I think, is where the idea that humanities research results may be subjective comes through, because the way people work towards those results is quite individual. But at the same time, the fact that humanists work on their own and they prefer to be completely left to be a singleton scholar was something we also felt was not uh, supported by the research we did. Because humanists do collaborate. They don't necessarily co-author. They don't necessarily work in laboratories together. But they are always drawing on each other's knowledge, whether it's through conferences, whether it's through networks, whether it's through personal connections, whether it's through teaching, whether it's through writing support groups online. All of this we found was used. There was no person we interviewed who worked alone, and yet there was no person we interviewed who worked together in the same way. So this heterogeneity was quite important in what we found. And as I said, some of this will echo with processes you'll find in the sciences, engineering, technology. There may be more physical grounding if there is, for example, a lab bench, or there may be a, a more of a sense of the writing being something that you do at the end. But Again, differences in degree. However, one major difference we found that I think has a real important role to play in the way we see research infrastructure is this question of instrumentation. Now, for Nora Satina, um, instrumentation was, in high energy physics, it is the sensor. So it's a physical object that takes readings as an atom goes past or as an event occurs. In microbiology, for her, her way of thinking, the instrumentation that consolidated the lab capital in a similar way was the, um, the way in which processes were documented. So everyone in the lab had the access to the same processes, so they would have the same kind of results, as if they were creating a sort of a, a multimodal human technical kind of sensor. So in the way, for example, that people would remove um, uh, physical uh, objects or physical physical bits of, uh, of an animal, of a research animal, as a, a part of the research process. What happens with the humanists that we found is when they describe the similar part of their research process, you know, there's all these other parts where we felt, okay, that is not a place where we see a difference in the culture. But in the instrumentation, we saw a real difference because it was layering of sources, layering of first primary sources, secondary sources, theoretical material, perhaps the results of a technical tool, perhaps personal lived experience. All of these various influences become layered. And the description of the research process becomes a way of describing how I read something in a piece of primary material which reminded me of something that I'd read in a secondary material. And I was looking at this from a feminist point of view and I'd remembered and it's about going up and down these layers until such time that a resolution can happen and a gap in that dry stone wall, in that set of layers, can be identified and then can be filled. So it's really a matter of finding those gaps and finding ways of filling them and using all of these different layers to do that. Now, this is, I think, a very, a, a very good way of viewing um, the humanities research process and of viewing what we need to do. Because one thing we need to remember is that in all of these, if we look at these various layers in the resource, none of them really count as raw data. And this is one place where we struggle sometimes in data-centric infrastructures. We want to get back to the raw data, but the raw data always has somebody's epistemic mark on it. Whether it is 
the archivist who collected it, whether it is the bureaucrat who wrote it down, whether it is the person who delivered the speech about which the bureaucrat was writing, whether it is the piece of literature, which is a work of art, which is a work of somebody else's creative function. The, the, there's questions as to whether there's raw data anywhere, really, because there's always something that has to capture and consolidate that data. But in the humanities, we particularly struggle with that. We particularly struggle with data federation. So I would highly encourage you, if you're interested in the kind of epistemic cultures and how epistemic cultures may be um, creating challenges in your, uh, in your environment, to dig in to a similar kind of protocol. And so what I have here is, is the, the questions from the, the shortened version of the protocol. Um, it's really about detailing your research through the lens of a single research project. So again, I highly recommend this as a, as a kind of um, a way of looking within your own community at the kinds of perspectives and attitudes towards knowledge creation you may be trying to support. So this is what we, we sent to people, and these are the questions we used. And you can see it's a fairly straightforward set of questions. Um, where did the argument come from? How did you develop it? Did you take notes? And this, the um, results of the original research is forthcoming, um, and we'll provide the link to this associated with the video once it's finally been reviewed and released. But to give you a bit of a sense, if you're interested in, in what these protocols look like when they're delivered, um, this is, you may recognize one of these people. Um, this is myself, and this is my co-director of the Humanities Research Center here in Trinity College, Dublin. I come from a humanities research background, and Owen comes from a, a background in um, computer science. So we actually sat ourselves down and decided to see what the epistemic culture match looked like. And these, um, these videos are available for you uh, on the, uh, the website as well if you want to take a look at them as a comparative uh, study in the humanities culture versus the computer science culture, the ways we talk about our research. So in my uh, brief video, I'm talking about uh, a written piece called The Semiotics of Schizophrenia sole authored and published with Modern Language Studies, whereas Owen is talking about the multimodal metadata-driven approach to adaptive hypermedia services for personalized e-learning. And you can already see it's a collaborative piece of research and it came out of a research conference. But without telling you too much in case you want to watch these videos for yourself, um, a lot of these things you'll see come from different places. So. Both of them perhaps are embedded in our PhD work. We both took relatively early things. But where it came from after that, again, in my um, uh, sort of narrative of research, there's a lot of talk about exactly that kind of instrumentation that I was saying. There was a gap. There was a place where it seemed that a question was unanswered. And there was a lot of work around that that was really interesting and had interesting resonances into that gap, but didn't answer that. And I went so far as using things like the um, physician's desk reference, talking about the drugs that this particular author was taking and what effect that might have had on her mental state and the uh, diagnostic, diagnostic statistical manual of, of mental illnesses. So I was putting my, 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 my full set of influences quite wide in an attempt to really capture what was going on for this author. What's interesting if you hear the comparison of how Owen describes this early piece of research, he's really looking at a cohort of test subjects. He's looking at a context for development and he's looking at uh, technical work of two particular centers of excellence. So the inspirations are quite different. The way these research questions came about and the way these research questions were approached um, workspaces are also something that will come out very much in this. Um, I work just about anywhere. Um, I prefer to have my feet up, but I do work in coffee shops, on the bus, and I manage that quite actively. I, don't, I couldn't tell you why I do it, um, but I will tell you that I know when I need to move. Whereas when Owen talked about space, it was very interesting because um, he was focusing very much on the availability of the virtual space. For him, the place where the research takes place is the virtual space. So while he too may be disconnected in physical space, he's always coming back to one virtual space. Um, and he also looks at spaces that support collaboration. Um, 
Also questions about starting and ending work. Um, scribbled marginalia, uh, no, you know, looking at a clear endpoint but not being 100% sure where that endpoint is, getting some feedback, having a, an iterative, pro iterative approach to the writing. These are all classic bits of a humanities research process. I'm sure any humanist watching this would be saying, yes, this seems fairly straightforward and fairly recognizable. Um, whereas again, because Owen as a computer scientist is developing in a slightly different environment, his references are more to iterative cycles of user engagement, uh, tipping points when a system works, um, the write-up as a, a, something separate at the end of the process, and of course the, the track record and looking for a citation record uh, to come out of this. It's quite interesting to see the differences, and I would highly encourage you to take a look, if you're interested in this, at those two um, uh, short um, narratives about research, either before or after you take on a similar um, uh, exercise for yourself. So the conclusions from all of this would be that maybe that many computer scientists view their work almost as a social science, which we wouldn't necessarily expect from the outside, or at least certainly was a surprise to me. And, but it was grounded in the expectation that users know and will gravitate towards what they want. And this is something that I would say I find perhaps isn't always the case. Whereas a humanist will take stuff that's from everywhere and try and bring it together and will be very multimodal and very peripatetic and that will sort of wander through the research space in a different way. Is one wrong and one right? Of course not. Does this give us an idea of what kind of challenges we'll see when we start to develop a technical set of tools for a humanistic process or when we try and bring together a technical team with a humanistic team. Absolutely. I think it's very enlightening for that kind of approach. So in doing that, we have a need for different kinds of dialogues because we might be asking each other the wrong questions. We probably need different kinds of research spaces. So I would say my real interest right now is in the idea of augmented research environments rather than virtual ones because I've realized that there's no way that we can take the noise away from the signal if we start to try and consolidate everything into one place. We also need quite nuanced forms of engagement. So for example, where a tooling approach may be too advanced, it may be starting from an observable behavior, but not be reflecting the cognitive leaps that are being made underneath that. So these are the conclusions from the Sparkle project, but there's one other issue that came up in this research that I, I just want to have a brief word about. Um, because there's a very good article called Beyond Epistemicide, which when I found it I realized what was at risk in the development of these large-scale collaborative um, initiatives. Um, and I, I, would, I would encourage you to read the article because it's quite a lovely description of something I think a lot of humanists feel innately, which is that somehow their knowledge creation process is not valued in quite the same way as a STEM process might be, as one coming strictly out of these engineered you know, physics instrument-based or process-based disciplines. And what Hall is writing about is what he calls the great epistemicides, the four great epistemicides of the long 16th century, where there's almost a post-colonial resonance that we still have within our knowledge creation system. Um, and these, these epistemicides of the Muslims and Jews being expelled from Europe, the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas being colonized, and the Africans being taken and sold as slaves. And he says that after this, modern science was granted the monopoly of the universal distinction between true and false to the detriment of alternative bodies of knowledge. And whatever we do, however we bring people together, what we don't want to do is flatten the individuality and flatten the power of the humanities to act. Research infrastructure needs to support the research that is going to be done. It should add to the dry stone wall. It shouldn't take away stones. And it shouldn't try and turn those stones into something else. It shouldn't try and recreate the humanities in the form of the, the sciences, in the form of physics, in the form of microbiology. And I think this is the, the biggest challenge that we face if we're building research infrastructures, and one that I hope in some small way we will have supported you to do better or to feel more confident and comfortable with with this presentation today.